thank you for coming to this mini micro workshop. Uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, uh, Nora Binnings uh, with us. So the first talk will be by, by her. Thank you for coming. No problem. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I, um, I'm looking for, I was looking forward to this because I feel like an honorary member of the, the physics world. Uh, I'm actually a member of APS, and I often go to the, some of the APS conferences up in the, the US. And the machinery I use actually is pretty much not stolen, but borrowed politely from physics. Uh, <laughs> so I try to, uh, actually, it's my goal for this talk is actually to show you how the mathematicians have kind of adopted some of our methods from um, large deviation theory to actually work on some problems in both um, epidemiology and in population dynamics in general. So today I'm going to talk about using stochastic models in epidemiology. It's kind of an overview and a little bit about new mathematical methods that we've built on some of these methods. And um, then I also wanted to mention very quickly my collaborators. Um, Eric Forgerson is another professor at Montclair State University. And Garrett Nidu, he just got his PhD in environmental management, which is an interdisciplinary uh, doctorate, doctoral program that brings in all kinds of, of um, disciplines and using it to in environmental management. So we focused obviously on epidemiology, but there's all kinds of aspects to this where he's learned about policy, and it's a nice well-rounded type of program so that he can go out and make a real impact. And uh, he just started a postdoc at Los Alamos, so just to play with all the people over there now. So my goal, um, so what was motivated uh, by this project was to, of course, we want to cure all diseases, okay, and save the world. It's just a modest goal. and. And the idea is, um, you know, it's difficult to do this. Uh, and even the diseases that we've actually made a real good start at, uh, you know, polio and things like that, are starting to come back. And, and measles and a lot of these diseases, uh, we're having a lot of vaccination refusals and all these types of issues, social issues mostly now. But the whole point is that to actually achieve global eradication is very difficult. But what we do notice in data is that we do see local extinctions in diseases. And what I've shown here are two graphs. The first graph is, um, I've done some work on dengue. Um, we were working on this about you know, eight to 10 years ago, in, um, but mostly with uh, Thailand data. And what you can see here, this is over the years, and these are the numbers of infections per thousand. And you would have intermittent spikes. These are pretty seasonal, actually. But you can see that the amplitudes change. And, uh, but there are it, periods in between the outbreaks where there are very, very few, almost you know, zero in areas, actually. And to look a little bit more closely at that, we studied some, same thing in, in Thailand, some measles data, where we noticed that as a population increases, the um, frequency of the number of months with zero cases decreases. So you can see with the smaller populations, you would see more of this type of behavior with zero cases in between the spikes. So what bothered us was that the standard deterministic models did not capture these dynamics. And we were trying to figure out, well, what mathematical models would. So what we did see was stochastic models, if you run a simulation, a Monte Carlo method. Um, I call it Gillespie, and people get a little sad about that. And so <laughs> the idea is that if you run a stochastic model uh, in finite time for a finite population, you would see a, a a case where the number of uh, cases go to zero. Okay, now you can simulate this pretty regularly depending on the, the parameters. And what we wanted to do, what I want to do, is show you not only some of the standard stochastic um, epidemiological models that are being used. Um, this is old and new analysis. This is not all new by any means. We politely borrow, as I say before. Um, but what we want to do here is understand the dynamics. We use this to qualitatively understand dynamics. And what we do see here is that we can get an extinction, a spontaneous extinction, where the disease number goes to zero. But the new stuff that we've been working on actually is to flips this around. And, and we want to know how, stochastically, a, a disease is introduced into a population and where you get that outbreak. So it's both pieces of it. And you have to treat them a little differently, mathematically. So we want to understand not only, so we've made some, some great uh, strides in figuring out extinctions, but we need to understand now invasions as well. And what I've done here is shown you a, a model, it's a little bit messed up, but you can't see the line, sorry about that, 
Um, so this graph here <coughs> is actually the invasion of an Ebola disease model. So you can see for, in the beginning, you get the spikes. But what I've done here is, in time, um, I've actually increased the population, showing you what, from the last picture, showing you as the population increases, you see that the number of times it goes to zero cases in a month uh, decreases. So if, if you increase the population consistently, you know, as you go in time, the number of people infected actually goes from having these intermittent spikes to actually something that's above the graph where you don't get any zeros. And so I wanted to, to show you that this can happen in a model and also what, how can we be um, a little bit careful about the parameters and, and make sure that this doesn't happen for a disease like Ebola. We don't want that Ebola to become endemic. That would be bad. Alrighty, so you guys all know this because you're physicists. Um, this is just differential equations, no big deal. We're looking at fluxes. This is the standard model people use in epidemiology. You have a susceptible and infective model. So the whole population is, you know, two compartments. And the flux between, this is a mass action term where you have the infectious come into contact with the susceptible with a contact rate beta. And so that is your probability of which you catch the disease from this type of contact. You have and a, a recovery rate where the infectious goes back to susceptibles, and you can catch it again, and that's gamma. Um, the simplest, this is the simplest compartmental model, and uh, this is true for, you can use this for situations like bacterial diseases, malaria, or any disease that you can catch after recovery, common colds. And um, what we do actually is we're gonna reduce the population, sorry, the dimension, by saying that if we have an average population over time, which is N, and we assume n is large, uh, that the susceptibles plus the infectives is n, so we can actually replace one of the variables, and then we have a one-dimensional problem, and we can do everything analytically. So we put together our deterministic rate equations. So these are all the fluxes. And you can see here it's in two dimensions. What we're going to do is take this i differential equation, and we're going to replace the s with n minus i, and then we get a one-dimensional model. OK, everybody? Oops, that one. Okay, so that's what you see right here. So we have our reduced dimension, one-dimensional differential equation. But this is a mean field equation. Okay, that's really what it is. There's no noise. Everything's deterministic. And if you do the basic analysis, what you'll see is that you can linearize about the, so there's two steady states. You can linearize about each one. You know, find the eigenvalue. Yes? Everyone knows how to do that. You're all physicists. To calc one, I know it. Okay. <laughs> and, and so if you plug in zero, for example, okay, you can see that's a steady state, 0 minus 0 minus 0, right? Um, and if you, you actually look at the parameters that people use for diseases, most of the time we have a situation where the parameters make the disease-free equilibrium unstable and the endemic one stable. So therefore, you would get, if you start with any initial condition above 0, it would asymptotically approach the endemic state. Very boring. It's asymptotics. It's fine. Okay, and what you see here is this is a, a transcritical bifurcation, meaning that as I change the ratio of the parameters, so this is a standard um, expression that they use in math biology. It's the basic reproductive number, or reproduction number, depending on the literature. And you can see it's, it's equivalent to linearizing and looking at eigenvalue, but what they do is they actually um, set this equal to zero, and they rearrange it. And so that they look at the ratio. And if this ratio is bigger than 1, it's equivalent to the eigenvalue being bigger than 0. Okay? So what happens here is that if the eigenvalue is, so I'm going to say the basic reproduction number is bigger than 1, your endemic state is going to be stable. So you're on this side over here on the right. So R0 is bigger than 1. And what will happen is you have an unstable um, 0 for the infectious steady state. And then you have a stable 1 up here for the endemic. And vertically, if you think about what's going on with the dynamics, all the solutions approach the red line. And that's what you see right here. Make sense? OK. This is important only because when we do this in higher dimensions, there's lots and lots of variables and lots and lots of parameters, but it's the same idea. So as I said a second ago, this is very boring. This is, in the sense, you get asymptotics. The solution goes towards a steady state, and that's all you have. You never see die out. You never see outbreaks. You never see anything. And this gives you an idea of the parameters that are necessary for the, the die-out state to be stable. And that's what you want to do with vaccinations. You want to actually get it so that this population cannot hold the infection. And that's what they've used for years. The reproductive number has to be something for measles, like 97% in the US. And 
Um, so what we want to do is explore other types of dynamics, especially when there's no vaccine. Okay? For, so Ebola, there's no vaccine for a long time. Dengue didn't have a vaccine. Um, so what we want to do is explore populations, uh, these dynamics and populations, when you're not going, doing something more than just staring at the basic reproduction number. So what we did was we started to, to explore stochastic modeling. And this is the random interactions within the system. So I'm looking, for, I'm looking at internal dynamics, internal noise. This is not the Langevin type of external noise term in a continuous model. That I'm going to look at discrete uh, populations. Okay. Um, it's a, you can actually capture the same effects with the continuous models. But in this case here, like I said, I'm going to use a master equation approach. And we're going to think about, so if we, as I said before, in simulations, you generate the random numbers for the different events that happen, and you can actually generate one of these <coughs> extinction events. What is it really? It's a potential well. Okay? The steady state for endemics at the bottom of the well. I want to shake it such that the ball marches up and over the barrier. And it can either march up to a barrier like this, a disease-free state, or over to another steady state where the system would be bistable. And we look at both of those. There's escape. There's, um, so this would be like an escape type of thing. There's also switching. There's lots of phenomena you can study. And this is documented well in the physics literature. So um, if you want a, a quick overview, you can look at the Van Campen um, book. It's very clear, lots of examples. Uh, they use a, a chemical kinetics type of approach. And what we do here, though, is uh, we just generalize, very physics-y, uh, into a discrete state vector. We're looking for probabilities of changing the states of the vector. So we have, instead of x1 and x2, that would be my susceptibles and effectives. These are the states. And you see how many are in that state at that time. So remember, the, the numbers in here would add up to the total population. Um, and then what you have are these random state transitions. And most of the time, especially for my SIS model, you would be literally changing one at a time. You would say, ah, oh, one person was added from susceptibles to because they got sick. One person would be moved from the infectives back to the septals because they got better. One person died. Hmm. <laughs> Someone was born. Yay. Okay. So what you do is you, you're kind of thinking about all of these, these states and the transitions. You multiply the, the transition rate times the probability. You take the gains. You subtract the losses. You take the sum. And what you end up with is this is a master equation. Yeah. Okay. It's just a, a formula. So you can put this together for any system. Um, the trick of this now, though, is to normalize, because the idea is that the, the transitions, the adding one and subtracting one, is very small compared to the total population. And if you take an expansion of the system, a Taylor expansion, then you can get rid of the small terms. And so what you do is, and so this has been done over the years, and you can take your master equation, you normalize it. And what we do, the real trick of this is we're going to take the WKB approximation. This is a ansatz for the probability distribution. And if the system is quasi-stationary, meaning that the steady states are far enough away from each other with a low probability in between, this will work. Okay? And so this, this is our expression. It's an exponential. And if you take a um, to leading order, so if I expand it, throw away the small terms, to leading order, what you end up with, with using that ansatz, is a Hamilton-Jacobi equation. You get Hamilton's equations which has very nice properties, lots of nice math, and we use that to run with it. Okay? Um, remember, this system has, okay, in this ansatz, instead of having the entire distribution being a function, what we've done is we've put the unknown function up here. It's called the action. The action is this, this S. And when we actually do our expansion to leading order, we don't have any S's, that function, but we do have the derivative with respect to the state. And that's going to be this variable p. We're going to call that our conjugate momentum. And that captures the effects of the noise in the system. So what we've done is turned it into what I call a deterministic looking system. But the effects of the noise is in a variable. So if p was 0, there would be no noise. Okay? And back to the deterministic situation from before. And so we can look at this Hamiltonian and look at the different energy levels. We look at when the energy is zero, and we're going to have all kinds of nice dynamics come out. So remember, um, this is capturing. So if I actually can solve this equation, then I can uh, to approximate the action. So the action and all that comes back from, um, it started with a Brownian motion with uh, Einstein, and then 
Uh, Richard Feynman did a whole lot of work on this. And so there are some nice pap papers by Feynman on, on how to, to uh, solve these. And, and so if you can actually solve for this action, remember that's the probability distribution. And one over the probability is the frequency. And if we can integrate along the path it takes for an event to happen, we can actually get the mean time to extinction. And so the formula is all about solving for the, what we want to do is minimize that action or the work involved to get from one state to the other. So you integrate along that instant time. I call it a manifold. And then you can end up with a nice ex, uh, mean time for one of these events to occur okay. without simulation, all analytical. So going back to our SIS model, what we ended up with. So this was the mean field equation from before. That's deterministic. And we thought about the different transition rates. So you have your addition by infection and removal due to recovery and death. You put it into the formula. And the next step, of course, is to take these distributions, these probability distributions, and put in our WKB approximation, the ansatz. So you put that in, and you end up with this kind of a Hamiltonian. See, there's just a couple of um, exponentials. And this is actually what we describe as a nice equation. Very nice, and because you can solve it. So the point here is that if P is 0 or I is 0, you'll get that the Hamiltonian is energy level 0. And then there's one other solution in here that depends on your variables. So it, uh, P and I are dependent on each other. And I'll show you how they relate in the next picture. So you can take your, your partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian, and you get your Hamilton's equations. This is a nice dynamical system. So you're back in my mathematical world. I like to analyze these things. You can find, you make both of those uh, differential equations equal to zero. You end up with steady states, and you put the whole picture together. Okay, so this is just a lot of you know equations at the moment, but here's my big picture that explains it all. So those three steady states are here, here, and here. So like I said before, when p is zero, so that's along this axis at the top here, that's my deterministic case. There was the endemic state, and you can see the arrows showing the endemic state for my parameters is stable. The extinct state, and you can see along that line for my arrows, the extinct state is unstable. And if you were just in the deterministic world, if you started anywhere on this axis, you would just run to the right to the endemic state. Okay, that's all the solutions. That's that asymptotic stuff from before. But by adding the noise, I've added a dimension. I've added this, this vertical dimension. And now I'm able to escape, because remember in Hamiltonian systems, all the steady states are either saddles or centers. Okay, So the saddle allows you to escape. You can escape down that third solution. Remember, it was I equals 0 and P equals 0 were two Hamiltonian um, energy level zeros. But then there's this third one that had the I and the P dependent on each other. This, the instanton, allows you to escape from the endemic state to this other, I'm calling it the fluctuational extinction state, because if I project down, it looks just like an extinct state, but the P is non-zero. So I can see, by using more dimensions, the solution we weren't able to capture with the deterministic analysis. And that's what we're seeing when we simulate. Okay? So what we can do is, as I said to you before, integrate along this path, and that's called our optimal path. That gives us our minimum work to get from the endemic state down to the extinct state. And on average, this is going to be, the, so this is the expression. And if we actually, we could, there's a way for us to fit the Gaussian distribution in the front to come up with a constant. Okay, that's a little bit more work. We can talk about that offline it's in these. But this is the simulation. And I'll show you that this expression for the mean time to extinction actually captures what you see in your simulations. So that's what these purple dots are here. So the simulation is 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations using like a Gillespie algorithm. You flip a coin to see which events occur. You add to subtract. People get sick. People get better. People die. You know. And you can see that as we increase my basic reproduction number, this is the average number. And this is over several um, time scales. And you can see that as we increase R0, and then we put the theory, which is this, this line for this expression right here, it matches up just right. And so this actually works. And this has been shown over and over again in the literature. So there's a problem down in here. And that's because as R0 goes to 1, remember what happens are the two steady states come together, they converge, and you don't have quasi-stationarity. And therefore, my ansatz doesn't apply anymore, and you have to do something else. OK? 
Okay? But it does a very good job up here, and I would have kept going, but it takes too long. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's the basic gist. And so now I'm going to go a little bit faster and show you some fun stuff for Ebola. So what we have is an understanding of extinction. And we could actually, in for Ebola, we can actually find the extinction, but what we're going to do is look at invasion. So what we have here is a, um, just a quick overview of Ebola. The reason why this was exciting, actually quite scary, back in 2014 was the, the fact that there was these outbreaks that just kept occurring in that same time series way. Here and there, around um, in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And then you see, this is for two years, from 2014 to 2016, there was almost 30,000 cases with an enormous number of, of deaths. The mortality is very high for Ebola. And what we're trying to do is figure out how can one um, figure out or approximate the number of, or how often these outbreaks will occur in the future. We want to predict. And in this picture over here on the left is showing you, they've had a lot of these outbreaks. Um, so Ebola is in the red, and they have little tiny years just showing you that this is not uncommon, first of all, throughout um, Africa. And also they have Marburg Berg disease. So what is Ebola? It's a zoonotic disease, zoonotic, if you want to say it that way, um, where there is a pool of animals um, that have the disease, and it jumps from the animals to the humans. Okay, And it can be done through um, um, humans obviously can pass it to each other, but we can also catch it from bats and apes. There's also stories about snakes and other things, and they're just not sure where it comes from. But it's randomly introduced into the population, and then randomly has, we have these outbreaks. So what we wanted to do is figure out from a same side of kind of approach, this compartmental model, possibly with stochastics, to figure out, because we, we know that the, the, the zoonosis part of it has to be random. If it was a deterministic thing, which is a constant stream, that would be a completely different set of you know, dynamics. This is something that happens once in a while. And so what we have is a susceptible person. Um, they can become infectious through like a mass action term again, just like before. And, and what we do is we see they go into an exposed group because they're not infectious immediately, but the, the disease builds up before they become infectious, and then they move down to infectious. Once they're infectious, they can either go to the hospital, but you know, some people don't go to the hospital, and they end up, they can either recover, which is a good one, or they can die, which is a bad one. And this is an Ebola death, because it has a mortality. And what we're also seeing is the fact that when people um, are deceased, people, when they're handled, they were actually spreading the disease as well. So there was a couple ways for this disease to be spread, more than for a regular case of, you know, a cold or a measles or something like that. So we were trying to figure out through the infectious human contact and the animal reservoir, which is random, how does that actually go, th you know, when we model this with the stochastics, what does that mean? And we, we put together our, these are the transition events. The new thing here compared to before is that we have this animal transmission. So this was the mass action terms from before. You have an infectious group. You have the, the deceased group that's not handled well. And also there's a very small group of the hospitalized group that, that gives the disease off as well. So this is just like before, except for the fact that you don't recover and catch it again. This is going to be something, this is called an SIR model, because you recover and you don't get it again, hopefully, even though they say that it does pop up in some of these people. And, and you can see here, that these are just all of the different um, fluxes that we put into our master equation. I'm not going to show you that. It's very long. But it is nice. If you actually take this kappa, so if you take the animal part away, it's a nice closed system. You can get an analytic solution for the steady states and those types of things. Um, not for the master equation, but what we did was we simulated it and we've tried to figure out what's going on. And as we increase that reservoir, that animal reservoir um, effect, you can see when it's very, very small, when kappa is very, very small, the proportion of time that you're disease free, no disease, is very high. Okay. And then as you increase the kappa, that drops down. This is actually more than exponential. And you get to, obviously, you have the disease most of the time. And what I've shown you here are three different time series. So very, very small kappa is up top here. You have intermittent spikes that are actually quite large. As you increase the kappa, you get the spikes to happen more frequently, and they're smaller. And then eventually what you end up with is something that's more endemic looking where it just kind of bounces around some sort of endemic state. Even if it's not an endemic state, it kind of has this average look to it. 
Okay? And we want to know a metric, something that tells me how to tell the difference between this and this, but analytically. We don't have that right now. So we went back to our basic reproduction numbers. Now, can that tell us? And so we get it to work sometimes. This is a case where it worked. Uh, what I looked at again was the proportion of time uh, with, without the disease. So that's the green here, okay? So 98% of the time you don't have the disease in the green. We overlaid an R0 as we changed two parameters. One is the contact rate for the infectious. So that, you know, when a population hears about a disease, they say, huh? So they change their behavior. So these are the things we can do when we don't have a vaccination. And down here, this is the, the time to burial. So if we increase the rate, we get them buried faster and quicker, I mean, in a more safe way. Um, then you can see that down in the right corner, this is very little contact with infectious people. This is really fast burials of the people who died. So we have very sparse outbreaks, and it makes sense. And then the top left, this is you know, lots of contact, really slow burials, and this is the bad part. So we have this orange down in here, but the only, there's only one contour we can grab, and it's way up here at 96%, and it's like, ah, I want more. I want more information here. And maybe this isn't working because, remember, the, the onsets only worked, remember, when you had um, quasi-stationarity and things are very far apart. So we went back to the original system. We went and said, okay, let's do the basic, basic one, back to SIS, but we put our little zoonotic disease term in there. This is exactly the same as before, but just a little bit of red here and there. And we said, what does this introduction of the zoonosis do to the model for the SIS? And so we got to the master equation here, and you can see there's little kappas here and there. There's one here, there's one here. And what happens to that? What does the kappa do to the system? Well, it actually messes it all up, <laughs> okay? Because you don't have the, the disease-free steady state just to start with, okay? So you're messing up a lot of the algebra that was so nice and the system was so closed and perfect. So we had to do something else. And what we ended up doing was we solved it. God bless Maple and Mathematica. <laughs> so this is where I'm saying you, you plug that system into Mathematica and it gives you a solution. I know my friends here from the consulate, they still don't think that's a solution. Um, but physicists do, right? Okay, because <laughs> this is a gamma function. And all you have to do is plug in your parameters. Okay, and what you'll see is the fact that you can actually get numbers for this. This is a probability distribution. We can evaluate for any i. You give me an i, that's just a number, believe it or not. This is a coefficient out front, and there's a normalization factor out front here. This is the um, pi naught, we're calling it, but this makes sure that the area under a distribution is equal to one, okay? And so what we do is we can actually look at this expression and compare it to what we see in the dynamics from the simulations. So very quickly, I'll just show you the end of this to show you that it works. This is an analytical way to predict where you would have the outbreaks that were very sparse to where you have the endemic state. So we started off with the simulations. This is just the fraction of the time with disease. If I use my Monte Carlo Gillespie simulation, um, if I'm increasing the population or my kappa here, what you're going to see is that for very low populations, a very small kappa, you have um, the fraction of the time with disease is smaller. With, remember this is with, this is upside down. My, Garrett gets dyslexic on me, it makes me crazy. And so this is the small, and this is a lot, okay? Lots of time with the disease. This is like the, the world of um, endemic, okay? And he came up with these dotted lines, and let me explain to you where they came from. So what we ended up doing was, these are the simulations, and then we looked at the associated probability distributions. Okay, those are the, the rows that we solved for with those nice gamma distributions, or expressions. And what you'll see here is that when you have, for example, something like this, this is quasi-stationary. Quasi-stationary means that there's a good space right here between what I call the endemic state and the die-out state. Okay, so it's a rare event to go from here to here. And if you find the area under the curve, it's actually, it's big. So the normalization is small. Um, and same thing here. This is still, it's a little bit smaller than this. You can kind of see, I'm sorry, the numbers are small. But basically, as I increase the population and I increase kappa, <coughs> you get the endemic states up here. And down here, what you'll see is over and over again, these types of distributions, meaning that most of the time you see it at zero. And that's what we saw before, these outbreaks that happened once in a while. And these areas under the curve actually are very small. 
Because as you can see here, this is two, uh, uh, e to the minus 4. So this is really squished up. He didn't, if he put this all on the same scale, it would be very boring because these green lines would be all squished up against the left. But these are actually faster than exponential decay. So these are very small areas on the curve, which means very large normalization factors. And you can see the spikes happening every once in a while. So what he did was he, he kind of thought about the difference between the three time series and, and a, what's a threshold measurement that we can use. And the first line and the second line are actually pretty interesting. So eventually this, if you change the parameters continuously, this Gaussian type distribution moves to the left. You can see it getting closer to the left here and here. And as it moves to the left, it actually this left edge raises up and it gets to here. So in between this picture and this picture here, you can see almost a slope equals zero type of curve. So you can actually evaluate when i is equal to 0 and look for where the slope of the probability is 0. And that's going to be this line up here. And then the other one he looked at was where did, from here to here, where does the distribution go from exponential to more than exponential? So he found out what, you know, the, the parameter where it's exactly exponential. And that's going to be this line right here. He took the average of the two, and that's the black line. So there's a region in there where the dynamics fundamentally change. And so you can see that's what we're trying to do. We're going from the quasi-stationary to exponential to the not exponential, sorry, the beyond exponential. In general, that's what the idea is. And then we looked at the pi naught, that normalization factor, and found that it does a very good job in the same way. We can actually look for, for those expressions, and they, they kind of give you the same idea. Because when the logarithm of pi naught, OK, so remember what the logarithms, the area under the curve is 1 log of 1 is 0, and you can end up with this green. So you have that same idea, is that you can look at these just from that one metric and get an idea of where the endemic is compared down to the, the this, this spiking every once in a while. And what we're trying to really do here is determine where subpopulations are actually um, 1. And, and that's the biggest question here. What is a population? What's the functionality of it? And if you have enough of the zoonosis coming in so fast like a fire hose, it's not really a random effect anymore. And it doesn't make any sense at all to use a random, you know, generated, like, you know, um, randomly um, introduced population effect. You should just make it a deterministic kind of equation in that sense. And the other side of things, if it does happen every once in a while and it truly is a random introduction, and then you're going to have this, um, lots of spaces in between the outbreaks, then you should be using this. So we're using this as a metric between um, what is a population and also to really rethink the idea of sympatric and allopatric, meaning the geographies of the population you're modeling. Because just because they're geographically close doesn't mean that they should be one population. They can actually be two with random effects in between. And there's a meter when you need to do that and when you don't. Because it's like, I need the simplest model possible, but I need to actually, you know, to characterize this, 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 this phenomenon I want to, to model. Okay. So that's the idea here. And, and that's my talk today. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you understood a little bit about stochastic population modeling. Um, we have developed these new methods to kind of figure out what's a population and, and random effects into a population to induce some sort of um, outbreaks or invasion, I'm calling it. And what we're going to do, what we can do with this as well, is understand um, improved control methods. Uh, we're going to continue to quantify these invasion dynamics. This is brand new work in the sense that it hasn't been published yet, so I apologize. I don't have that. We've also worked on seasonality on top of these optimal paths. That stuff just uh, has um, popped up. Uh, if you look in SIAM review, what we've done is a, um, a new paper should be coming out soon with a, a nice introduction to these types of methods. because. The mathematicians don't know it in the right language. So the physicists have lots of words for this. You know, like I said before, you instantons and, and action and all these things. And the mathematicians have a whole lot of tools, Melnikoff methods and things like that, that we can apply and actually do a lot of work with this. And um, of course, what we always want to do is experimental verification. So that comes from data, running our own experiments. I have my students with their little beakers, with their, their little bacteria and algae running around eating each other, like predator-prey systems. And what we're really looking for, and eventually, is to get to not just one extinction, but extinction cascades. I love um, ecological food webs, where you can actually describe what's going to happen to an ecosystem as you make a change. You know, hand of God, take something out <laughs> and say, 
how, what, how does it all figure itself out and come back to equilibrium? So, and then just, uh, I had two other collaborators working on the Ebola stuff with us uh, from the IBM Albenden Research Center. They were the ones that had the parameters for our Ebola, so we were using um, some real uh, data from the outbreaks in Africa, and thank you very much. I would love to, yes. Um, that, that would be also another type of random event. Mm -hmm. What we did with the dengue was we were looking at the, how, much, how much harder it was to support another serotype. Okay. And it showed this kind of exponential decrease. It was really easy to go from one to two to three, but when we got to four, things kind of flattened out. And it was a lot more, it was harder to put a fifth one in because you get into this world. So my, my goal actually is exactly like you just said. I think of it as an energy. And for a food web, for example, you have all of them using up the energy in some sort of balance. And that's pretty much what the ecologists do. They find their steady state, they take a Jacobian, and they, they ana analyze the Jacobian as if it's the model. I'm like, no, 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 it's just a Jacobian around a steady state. So as you move things, you're going to mess up the steady states, and you have to do more. And you actually have to look at the dynamical system. And I would love to actually figure that out. Where is the space for someone to invade? So if you put an invasive species into a food web, how does that work? And also, same idea, if you pull some sort of species out, how do the existing species come in and, and use up that space? Yeah. That's my proposal. Let's do it at the end of the month. <laughs> a question. I have a question that, uh, about the actual, uh, I mean, the dynamics of transmission of uh, Ebola uh, from animals to uh, people. Mm -hmm. it, that's probably very different, it's different in cities from, from the wilderness. That's right. And uh, mm -hmm. so this would be more, this random uh, uh, events are connected mainly to transmission in, 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 in not in cities, yes? Correct. Um, actually, what they showed was, um, so while they had, when I put you this little map up, uh, I was mentioning here, I didn't say it out loud because I was trying to be quick. Uh, the, in April, they had another one of these outbreaks of Ebola. This was after, of course, this one went by and everyone was on high alert and they said, what do we do? And, and just like you said, uh, you have some sort of remote rural area that they catch, catch the disease somehow, however that is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes through very quickly through that rural, vi rural village and then it gets spread to the clearest, so sorry, the closest um, urban area, which was, they said here, there were, it's a rural area of the Congo, but then it was starting to make its way to these urban areas. And because of that, um, they started to get ahead of it with the, there's a vaccination uh, uh, in trial, and they, they started to do contact tracing, and they got ahead of it, and they actually had this thing under control in seven weeks. It cost a lot of money. But, but basically, like you said, the, the contact rate for the rural area is much different than the urban so area. The kappa will be different. I mean, yeah, and the kappa, kappa will be, be different as well. In, exactly. In, uh, in, the, in, in, a, in a large city. That's but right. There, in, this is transmitted by which kind of animal? It's apes? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the world um, right now thinks of its bats and apes. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know if, as biologists, you have more to say about that. Uh, well, yeah, bats is the uh, bats. Bats. Yeah, biggest hypothesis of the Right. They It's, it's a scary one that we you know, don't know what happens. But the thing is that the good news about that disease is that it burns itself out so quickly. Yeah. It'll never be, I mean, we think it'll never be endemic because it kills its, you know, the people so fast. Yeah. So um, under, you know, there are very long diseases, like yeah. HIV and other things. And then there's very, very short diseases. And um, this is the one that has a high mortality, but it burns out. But I'm worried, as I said before, if you play around with the 
the, um, the way that the, not just the people spread it to each other, but with that introduction, like you said, if, if it gets out of control, I, I don't know if there's other ways for this to happen. Uh, it can become endemic, could, um, if it's in the right conditions. Yeah. Or more common, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, to exponential, super exponential, and so on, right? Uh, kappa, you, you use dimensional units, right? And, uh, Everything is non dimensionalized in my normalized. But then yeah. it should somehow depend on, on the speed of the, di of the dynamics itself, right? Even in the non dimensional cases, right? Or, or is it. Okay, so. So, is so it even in, I don't know, 10 to minus 7. Sure. So all of those were days, and then we non-dimensionalized them and put them all in the same. So when we sent this to, uh, this was a published in PLOS one, and so the the populations. And I have them on my, my computer if you're interested in looking at them. The the kappa makes sense in the the idea of how often it's very small in in terms of days and years and all that fun stuff. But yeah, it makes sense. Um, and, and the way that you're saying that the number makes physical sense if it was dimensionalized, if we put it back into the years. And so, uh, yeah, that's, it was a, they can bring it all the way back to people per days getting, in, you know, getting exposed. And so we have to actually work back through the numbers. And I didn't show all the details, I apologize. Yes. Well, that, that was the whole, yeah. So you can relate it to the... It depends on, on a combination of surrogates. No, no, you're right. Um, so what we did was, so that they're much higher. This is very, very small. Less than birth, okay? And so the reason why is that it's, you could do also this with a um, Poisson kind of pulse, okay? There's all kinds of ways you can introduce the noise. And what I was hoping is that you can think of this also as if you had a population and you had some sort of external source. It could be just from travel, like you have a population and the travel and the people are bringing in measles or whatever it is, or if you can bring in, um, so it doesn't have to be migration anymore where people move into the population and stay because these diseases are spread so quickly. And so yeah, this is, and magnitude wise, it's much, much, much less than the regular contact rate. And, and so I can give you the reference to the paper, but yeah, it has um, very biological, um, a history, a, pre a precedent of, of where the, the number was, uh, so the range of numbers. So some parameters are, are less um, sensitive than others in these types of models. And this one here, we kept it very small on purpose. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, you can relate it, and, and it's a very small fraction. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like because there are more sick people in the hospital. That's right. So do you think there would be a way to uh, I don't know, change the parameters as the disease progresses? So Absolutely. Apply this or is it too late? Yeah, no, no that's, that's exactly what happens in real life. And that's what did happen in the cases I was showing you because people I and mean, we all, it happens in, in, in you know, groups, whatever the disease is, people stay home, they get nervous. And they did that, and, and a lot of the, the contact rates did dropped. And then they did change their behaviors and their, their burial rituals because they knew it was dangerous. And that, that's a big deal, actually, because that was something they didn't want to do. But um, this is, um, I, I think of this as, uh, here's an example you can all, well, maybe you're younger than me, uh, <laughs> understand. Uh, you know, um, email viruses, uh, disease, uh, sorry, uh, spam emails that have um, whatever uh, things to click on. And everyone knows, don't click on that one. It's a terrible um, trap. <laughs> and, and it'll affect your machine and, you know, all bad things will happen. Um, so what'll ha you can see profiles from the different uh, virus uh, companies of a spike of a certain email virus, and then it drops off immediately. And, and the ones that are just word of mouth and, and they can update their registries and things like that. So the, 
the contract rates and the, the susceptibility should be a time function, time dependent function that drops immediately. The other part was um, the other ones that are slow and in the background that you don't know about, those contact rates you kind of just monitor along and there's, there's no reaction to it. So there's two fundamentally different types of, of dynamics here. But I think that you're right, that the ones that are out there in the media saying, hey, be careful, um, then you actually have this, this change of behavior that happens. And what you can also see is when uh, Sarah does her talk next, that people do things to look for cures and, and information about the diseases. So she's going to talk a little bit about dengue. And what she finds is that uh, people go online and say, hey, what's this disease about? What should I do? And so, yeah, um, you can actually see it coming in the sense of the people self-reporting. And then at the same time, they, they actually stay in and they get nervous and all that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like that idea a lot. Yes. That's right. Yes. No, that, that's exactly right. And um, also, it's the same idea as well as that they know what to do with the disease. You can get the recovery time to be faster for certain cases, whatever the diseases are. So, and that's the same thing for computers. <laughs> the computers will be infected for less. So you can apply this to a lot of different things. And then with the stochastics, um, I mean, we're even applying, this is, this is from high energy physics, actually. The, um, the stochastics, uh, the simulations jumping from state to state, you can do it with Joseph's injunctions and things like that. So, I mean, this is a phenomena that's been studied widely <laughs> and, and can be applied to a lot of things. So they're thinking about using this for switching in, inside of intracellular dynamics. For example, when uh, cancer cells turn on and off and, and, you know, reproducing very quickly. So there's a lot of these types of switching events that happen that we can to model with this. And then, of course, how can we change that rate, make it less easy to switch. It's the barrier in between two wells. Yeah. Good. So uh, you are saying that one, one way of using this result is to try to assess if you have two populations that you can actually treat as two, isol not really isolated, but Disjoint. Disjoint, exactly, that's right. So no population is really disjoint these days, right? Hmm? No population is really disjoint these days. Everyone's connected somehow. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, yeah, well, we have a lot of ecological situations. Yeah, well, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Human populations are very connected. But these days, yes. So when there's a thing yes. here, then it's yes. over there, right? Right. So if you mm -hmm. even if it's a very, very slight one with uh, a constant rate, then you lose this, right? So you have somehow to introduce. So, okay, so the, when I was finishing up there with my allopatric, okay, so normally, so where I live in Montclair, we're literally 20 miles away from New York City. And a lot of people travel into New York City to work, and then they come home, and they can bring the disease back and forth. But the, there's a lot of people who don't go. To, I haven't been in New York City in probably in two or three years. It's fine, <laughs> except for I went to JFK. Does that count? Anyway, um, so the, the point here is that you also have Impanima and Copacabana. That's where we were a couple days ago. And so are those two different populations? There's a question about that. I mean, do the people really wander back and forth? And so you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of people think that two things that are geographically close should have be modeled as one population or maybe not. Um, but when you think about airplane travel and everything else, you can have two populations that are very far apart that has a lot of stuff between them, a lot. And so I don't know what the definition, it's changing so fast. So if you go back to the original work by um, you know, Anderson and May and, and some of the beginnings of, uh, before the measles vaccines were actually even created, I mean, a lot of these diseases, first of all, would travel in a wave because people traveled on the ground, you know? And so you would see this in rabies. You can see this even in Thailand um, for um, the dengue uh, spread. And nowadays, for example, with the flu, uh, influenza, 
you could see things spreading across the entire world within a day or two. And it kind of pops up here and there. Um, so it, it's what we were trying to figure out is when you model, so for example, something that's a random once in a while kind of um, source, we're trying to figure out, is that the proper way to model it? Should it be modeled as one population? I mean, you can actually follow two populations. I have lots of data sets. For example, uh, one of the um, measles outbreaks back in the early 1900s, where you can see that Newark, New Jersey, if you don't know New Jersey geography, it's OK. I don't know the geography here either. Uh, <laughs> uh, at, in New York, do not have all of their outbreaks synchronized. But for some strange reason, Philadelphia and Boston have most of theirs synchronized. And so we cannot explain that. And so what it would do, in a sense, is make us think about what are those connections? Can we find them? And then maybe if we you know, took action on those connections, we could stop the <laughs> random outbreak introduction. I'm going to say random introduction that would cause an outbreak. So it's kind of like contact tracing. And, and so when you want to model something, the model is based on the question. And a lot of times, mathematicians just like to, we have a model and we go crazy with it. I mean, we really, we look at everything and we find all kinds of dynamics and they could have absolutely nothing to do with reality, okay? <laughs> these, these dynamics that are so interesting. So, but you have to go back to the, the biology approach of what is the question. And, and stick with that. So what I'm hoping to do is, is look at the question of should two populations, should it be a metapopulation? I like metapopulations. Should, it could be possibly a, a PDE. Or we're looking at something continuous across, us, have a spatial dimension. Maybe that's required. Maybe it's not. Maybe I can just go back to the completely, the SIS, really basic, no spatial component at all. Depends on the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, any other questions? So thank you again. Thank you. Now we have a, a coffee break. It's also the opportunity to talk to our invited speakers. <laughs> and uh, after the coffee break, a half an hour coffee break, then we'll see Sarah uh, Delvalli from the Salamis, and we'll give uh, her talk. And then in the afternoon, we have space out there. Okay, so. Uh, Is it? You know what? They did doing that with me too. And you have to show all your papers yeah, when you yeah. get there. Show like a password and stuff. Okay. So you want to? Thank you for the questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if I articulated it right, actually. I, I really like all this stuff about, you know, when you have sometimes metapopulation, sometimes you use explicit spatial models and so on. But the question is, how do you decide, right? Because against what could be the next global pandemic. You can clearly see how it starts in at airports, 